Welcome back. Uh, when we're talking about asset protection, a real cornerstone of that is trust planning. And trusts, uh, even the sound or the word trust can put a lot of people to sleep, uh, can put a lot of people off and say, well, that's that's for rich people, um, that's for people who uh, are, are, are in the final days of their lives. Um, I don't think we really need to worry about that. Uh, but that's certainly not true. Uh, there are a lot of really uh, basic things about trusts that everybody should know, specifically physicians. Um, so today I wanted to talk with Dan a little bit about some of the terms that we hear. Trustee, grantor, revocable trust, irrevocable trust, and just keep it on a really simple level of, of what these trusts are, how they work, and, and who are the key players in this uh, arrangement. Well, the first thing I would uh, say, Brad, is that uh, we are uh, working uh, regularly now at trying to provide these informational videos and we have one available to you on basic estate, estate planning already and uh, in that video that I address uh, your basic documents which include a poor will I'm not going to address that now uh, a revocable living trust power of attorney document and a patient advocate des designation, which is in Michigan we refer to as a power of attorney for healthcare. Uh, check out our video because these are essential documents um, and they should not be delayed. Uh, everyone, including uh, individuals who are not uh, married, should have a basic set of legal documents. As, as to our discussion and the, uh, the fact that we've alluded to the, uh, the idea of being able to utilize a living trust to insulate uh, and create asset protection for practicing physicians, um, there are two different trust documents that uh, we see. One is a revocable living trust and the other is an irrevocable trust. By their names, it should be obvious to you that the revocable trust is something that's revocable because it can be changed. It can be changed any time. In fact, a revocable living trust uses your own social security number and is essentially you. Um, in addition, the grantor is the person that generates, creates the trust and creates the provisions that uh, create instructions for the trustee and during your lifetime, you are the trustee of your own living trust. So now that you are the grantor of your own trust, you are the trustee of your own trust. You make all the decisions and then you are the beneficiary of your own trust. So you are the grantor, the trustee and the beneficiary of your own trust. The only time in which, well, there are two times in which that changes. One, one is when, if you become disabled or incompetent and you have a successor trustee, a backup. And we often recommend that there's one or two backups. Between married couples, the most common arrangement is each spouse has their own living trust and then it's followed um, in terms of six, the succession of trustees by the spouse. And below the spouse, you can have several other options or even on the same level of the spouse. So you could go this way, have a co-successor trustee, a spouse plus a brother-in-law, a spouse plus a bank. You can have a commercial trustee. Mm -hmm. We can talk about the pros and cons of those. And then it can go down to the sex of trust. If you have adult children that are responsible, you can have them listed. Mm -hmm. In fact, that changes. I actually saw someone last week, they drafted their documents in 2011 they had listed the wife's sister who lives in New York, who happened to be an attorney, and never reviewed the documents um, in terms of change. And what I asked them to consider with was the, sis the, the sister in New York, who is now someone who has Parkinson's disease, mm. and the t versus the children who are now eight years older have are married with their own children and mature adults should they now step into the role of successor trustees and the conclusion that the client said yeah we didn't think of that absolutely so they're going to be amending 
uh, the trust documents to make that change. Now, why would I have a revocable trust versus uh, a revocable trust? Well, the, there are two ways that we um, ultimately see irrevocable trusts uh, emerge. Um, the most obvious irrevocable trust comes if someone dies. If, if the grantor of your own trust uh, passes away, then that trust de facto becomes irre irrevocable, irrevocable as sometimes uh, people pronounce. And the reason it's irrevocable is because now the provisions of the trust are fixed. They no longer can be changed. And with that, we get a new tax ID number. So if, um, for my trust, it's a revocable living trust. If I die, it becomes irrevocable. We get a separate tax ID number because uh, it's no longer a living entity. And then the tr successor trustee steps in to carry out the provisions that I've laid out in the, in the trust. Um, the second way that you can have an irrevocable trust is simply to create one for the purpose of being able to have assets held outside of your taxable estate. Now, this is another way to ensure the protection of assets. So if, for example, you have three children and you're interested in gifting to them monies for various purposes, it could be for college education that exceeds those monies you're putting into 529 plans. It could be to purchase a home, have money available for a business, et cetera. You can gift money in a present value to an irrevocable trust. Those monies are now outside of your taxable estate. They can't be touched in a lawsuit because it's effectively not your money any longer. And yet it's for the benefits that you provide anyway. Um, and uh, while the estate tax now uh, is fairly liberal, there was a time and it, it could always revert to that uh, where you could have a state that easily exceeded that, but anytime you move money outside uh, of, of your estate into an irrevocable trust for other beneficiaries, it's no longer part of the calculation. So the irrevocable trust uh, can also be, in addition to using the revocable trust in terms of the lower income, or a wonderful means of asset protection uh, for those people at a higher risk of being sued. Uh, but I hear that taxes are pretty different for both of those. Can you talk about the tax differences? Yeah, so if we have a revocable living trust, um, you know, the, we are, uh, it's a password. It's, as I indicated before, it's uh, whoever's trust name. So my trust is the Daniel S. Hollander Revocable Living Trust. It's me. So any taxation is going to fall at my tax bracket on our 1040, mm -hmm. which is what my wife and I do when we file jointly. The irrevocable trust, again, is not an individual, it is an entity. It has its own federal tax ID number, and as a result of that, it goes at a corporate return, which is a higher tax schedule. So the, sometimes uh, we are discussing the question of making that an effective choice, and we use actually insurance. And because the insurance then is just putting a premium in the irrevocable trust that can mushroom into a larger death benefit, but you're not paying tax every year on large amounts of savings. You're only paying it on the premium. So it can be de minimis, whereas if there's a death that occurs, there's a large tax-free sum. Now that's created. So a different way of using an irrevocable trust is not only outside of your state, but mushrooms into a much larger um, uh, resource for surviving spouse, children, and is not attached to credit. So various vehicles, two different trusts, trying to have a panoply of options for asset protection. Yeah, my final, my final question on this uh, would be, you mentioned that uh, irrevocable trusts have incredible asset protection potential. Uh, what about revocable trusts? Uh, do they also have good asset protection potential? If you have uh, your investment account in a trust with you and your wife and you get sued, how protected is it? Is it more protected than a normal non-qualified account? Is it more protected than an IRA account? It is not. 
Um, if my name is associated with the trust, namely, as I said, I have a living trust, it is, as I also said, it's, it's essentially me. So if I get sued, you can invade my living trust. The way, you, the way it's protected is if I'm sued, but I have put money into Priscilla's trust. They can't attach Priscilla's trust funds to pay for my judgment uh, in a lawsuit. So okay. that, there's, there's the protection of the living trust. One important caveat there that I would like to point out, because we get this question every once in a while, uh, we get a call from somebody who's in the process of getting sued. They have two trusts. Uh, their trust is under attack from the lawsuit, and they say, we need to move money from that trust to my wife's trust. Um, that does not work. <laughs> yeah, that's correct. I mean, it has to do, do a priori, and like many things in law, you know, they, they're, they can smell out uh, manipulation of the law so that, you know, you need to do that 36 months in advance if you're going to move money in that regard. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Oh, uh, there's one more topic. I, I know we said we uh, had, but this is going to be a bonus round topic. Uh, this is probably a question we get uh, more often than any of these. Uh, when it comes to titling, you mentioned titling before, Dan. Yeah. Um, you can have your investment account titled, uh, we'll use a married couple as an example here, as a joint investment account. Or you can have it titled as a joint trust account. Correct. Uh, if you have it titled as a joint account, you can still have your trust as the primary beneficiary if something happened to you. Dan, what's the difference between having it titled as a trust account or titled as a joint account with the trust as the beneficiary? Well, that's a great question and I'm happy to answer that. Before I do, I just want to recommend to our audience that with the ongoing blogs that we are doing, we, are, we will also be having one uh, that's upcoming on advanced estate planning techniques. So look for that because we're really scratching the surface in this blog. As to the difference that, uh, that you're raising between uh, the, a, an account that is a joint, jointly held account that has a beneficiary designation, and I'll speak to that because that sounds odd, doesn't it? Or let's say a jointly held trust. The, when you have a, a jointly held account and it has a beneficiary designation, the beneficiary designation is called a TOD. The TOD is acting for transfer on death. So let me underscore this, that it, it, many of us have jointly held accounts, not only investment accounts, but accounts, for example, at a bank. You like you have a joint checkbook. Make certain that you have the transfer on death designation, a, a defective a surrogate beneficiary designation as you would have in your 401k plan or life insurance so that it does go to your trust. The, the primary difference between that and having your trust control is that the, the, the trust can immediately uh, have the trustee act. And when you have a trust beneficiary, oftentimes, you know, that you are having to submit uh, documents at that time and the bank's legal department will review it, there's a time delay. And then again, there's many people that have a, a, a joint trust account but don't have a TOD designation at all. And now if you have just a joint, a jointly titled account, so let's see you and I have a jointly titled account. Mm -hmm. And because this is the way I like it, you die first. Okay, perfect. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I'm the survivor. The, um, by operation of law, I get all of the money that we jointly held together. That may not be something that you want. Mm -hmm. That may not something that, that may need. It may be um, that we, as uh, having a joint account, had other obligation, business obligation we wanted to take care of, pay off a debt, so your wife got more through a buy sell, etc. Right. We need to have the instructions of a trust tied to that. Mm -hmm. So it's really critical that while convenience of jointly held assets um, can still be utilized to make sure that ultimately we do 
have trust instructions tied to either the joint account or have it owned outright by the, the living trust. Excellent, excellent. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I really hope you found it informative. Uh, please tune in for further video blogs and messages in the future. Thanks for taking your time.